So how many of you guys have had a chance to actually, or even knew that the RailsConfTutorials.com was a thing? Can you raise your hand? <laughs> okay, so like a few people. So just to reiterate them again before we get going, uh, you should have Ruby 2.1 installed on your machine. Uh, if you don't know how to do that or don't have it, just hopefully ask somebody uh, next to you. Uh, secondly, uh, at least have the first repo cloned from this slide, the application's first, uh, framework second. Um, you can also clone the chassis gem onto your computer. We'll be using it later, so just in case you cannot connect to the internet and bundle, uh, you can clone it onto your computer and point it against a local install then. All right, well I guess let's, uh, let's get into it. So my name is Adam Hawkins and I'm running this workshop called Applications First, Framework Second. The content of this workshop is mainly derived from the blog post and things I've been working on over the past year or so. Uh, they were linked on the railsconfitorials.com uh, website. Uh, maybe you have heard about oh. it, maybe you've read it, I don't know, but I wrote a blog post a series titled Rediscovering the Joy of Design, which focused on more hexagonal concepts, domain-driven design, separation of concerns, uh, things like that. I feel that's something that we're desperately, like we desperately need in the Ruby community itself. Um, so this is the first time I've done a workshop with this number of people. I have presented this content uh, multiple times, also in workshop format. The first time I presented this workshop was to a group of uh, Java developers, actually, with no Ruby experience, and it was a alternate introduction to Ruby on Rails. Uh, so today, I will now present the same material to a, a bunch of probably well-experienced Ruby and Rails programmers. Uh, so I hope at least some of you, maybe most of you, have experience working with Ruby outside of Rails, uh, because, well, that's what we're going to be doing today. <laughs> And I hope that's not scary, but um, that's where we're going. So this workshop will mainly go through a set of small predefined steps I've done inside the repo that hopefully everyone has cloned by now. So we're going to go through a, I think, 12 or 13 step progression. Uh, depending on how the time goes, maybe we'll do some live coding or what you guys want towards the end. Um, so in the repository, there is a branch for each step. I think they're named like feature slash step one or step two or whatever. Um, now, also, when we get going, I have the slides which encourage you to do the particular exercise in each step. Uh, and if you like, you can also look at the appropriate pull request on GitHub for the same, uh, for the diff or whatever. However, I do encourage you to try the steps on your own. If you'd like to, you can look at my solution or whatever. Um, but if you like, you can try to do this whole workshop on your own, following whatever things I suggest in your own branch or whatever. But the workshop will continue based on the diffs in my pull request. So I don't know if you have looked at the code already on GitHub, but on master is where we're going to end but that's not where we're going to uh, start. So how many of you were able to actually read some of the content that I posted in the prerequisites? Some, okay, some people. Okay, so we'll just start here, I guess. So how many of you attended the DHH's keynote? I think most people. If you connected strongly with that keynote, then this probably is the wrong place for you. I tell that to you not to scare you away, but to be honest with you about what you will get out of this workshop. Um, because these are things that I desperately care about and have experience working with, and I think are important. But members of certain areas of the community may consider these ideas and these implementations over-architecting or what they're using now as architectural astronaut or whatever. But I have applied these material, like these concepts and these patterns over the course of a few years and they have been really successful when applied to problem domains of a certain complexity. So if you're interested in learning about these things, 
great. But if you are interested in working on like small problems and don't necessarily care about doing the whole TDD thing, then just be upfront with you, then you probably will not enjoy yourself here. So just a heads up. Or if you want to be convinced, maybe it is convincing, I don't know, but that's just to be upfront and honest with you guys about what you'll be able to get out of this workshop. So this is the blog post or the blog series. And in this series, I talk about the ideas of kind of hexagonal driven design, domain driven design, separation of concerns, creating boundaries around larger parts of your application, and things like that. So one, I don't know if any of you had been to the talk earlier, but there was a talk on like views, presenters, decorators, like help me choose or something like that. And um, he had a slide where he talked to DHH about service objects and things like that. And DHH has said, I, don't, I think that's a complete waste of time. I have never seen a use case for that in the wild. Well, I tell you that they do exist, and I use them all the time with great success. So the blog post talks about how to correctly arrange some of these objects. So just to get on the proper terminology with all you guys, um, you may have heard these things called service objects. I refer to them as use cases. But since the vernacular during the conference has been service objects, we'll stick with service objects. So a service object is just something that actually does what the system is supposed to do. So it handles the user interaction or whatever. Then that takes input from something. I call this the form object. Um, so it's just responsible for modeling the user input. And the service object used that to do whatever. Now, difference in how I do things now is I use the repository pattern because that actually creates a real separation between the domain models themselves and how they are persisted. How many people here are familiar with the repository pattern? How many people have actually used it in practice? OK. So you'll learn how to do at least do some of that um, today. Now, unfortunately, in order to accurately demonstrate these concepts, we need a really big problem domain. And that cannot fit in a workshop. It cannot fit in a day or anything like that. So just to be more upfront with you guys, the things that we're going to do here will be over-architecting for this really small problem domain, because that's the only thing that we can actually work through in this context. So if you think that is over-architecting, then great. You are thinking the right thing. If you aren't, mm, you, should, uh, you should rethink yourself. So the point of this workshop is to demonstrate a certain way to solve problems so you can use them on a larger problem. I don't know how many of you guys have experience trying to build an application completely separate of Rails or anything, if it's a web app or a console app or even a gem. But I know for me, in the beginning, it was hard to actually think of what my core concepts are, what my thing is actually supposed to do separate from what it's supposed to look like or where the data is actually going to live. Um, so just things to keep in mind if you have problems uh, thinking like that, then hopefully this will be a good exercise for you. Now during the, during the workshop, I would like it to be mo more of an interactive experience. So don't just feel like you should sit on your computer and code or whatever. Ask each other questions. Ask me questions. If you want to go through the workshop as pairs, I highly suggest that, probably just to cut down on the bandwidth on the internet. But if you have like somebody you know next to you, then you know consider consider pairing. So we're going to do something that's very dumb and very trivial in a domain that we all understand, where we're only going to have one model. Actually, there's nothing else. We're just going to have a simple post object. And that's it. So people, I found, are also scared of patterns uh, in the Ruby community. I think people have been burned by Java and things like that. But don't be scared of patterns. I suppose the use of patterns on problem domains of certain complexity. And we'll see that uh, here. And it's going to be totally test driven from the very beginning. We're going to have service objects, form objects, repository and my gem called Chassis to kind of organate, organize some things on the outside of the hexagon, if you're familiar with that architecture. We're going to use active record for the persistence. We can get to the end. And 
we're going to use Action Pack to actually put this application online in the sense. So this will be our interface to HTTP and HTML and all the things that actually put the thing in front of the user. And with that, it's pretty much time to get started. So if you go onto your terminal or your command line, whatever, just check out like step, well, yeah, step one, I guess. Or your own branch from the very beginning. Um, but the first thing that we're going to do is, well, it's actually kind of hard to start at this point. But um, imagine you have a clean slate and you need to make something run test. So uh, can you actually, is there some way to go back to like the initial commit or something like that in Git? I don't know. Yeah, so let's just, let me get this shot for you so you guys can have a clean, a totally clean slate there. That fact actually totally slipped my mind. <laughs> huh? Well, I'm gonna, I'm getting the shot. Yeah. Yeah, that would work. Did everybody catch that? So if you check out this step one branch and then did get reset to head tilde two, you can go back to the very beginning. So now you should, once you do this, you should be like at a blank state and your job is to now set up the rig file so that you can run a test. So a hint for anybody, if you've never actually done this yourself from the very beginning, in your rig file, you'll want to use the rig test task to run a set of test files. And uh, throughout the workshop, we'll be using Minitest because it is built in the standard library, nothing else to install. Yeah. So just, yeah, at this point, you'd be in a det detached head. My mistake from the planning process, but after this, it will get easier. And once again, if you don't know or you're interested, you can see the solution to this by going into the GitHub repo and looking at the diff for this pull request or just by checking out the branch again. So this is just a simple placeholder test so you can write it doesn't do anything, but just some way to verify that your thing is working. So the question was, will we have to manually add a gem file? And the, and the answer is yes. And that's because you'll need to put rake into the gem file so you can do bundle exec rake, right? And then also to test your installation, you could switch this assertion to say assert false, and then you should see one failure. So once you have bundle exec rake passing, it's good. Give you guys a few more minutes, and then we can look at the solution and move on to the next step. As you can see, you'll have your test. You'll need a test helper. Um, what I've done is I've created also a placeholder file in the root directory just called app that will be used to load all of our future code. And then we just require many test auto run to run the tests. Okay, just to scroll up a little bit. This is all you need in your reg file to get this going, just in case you guys haven't got it yet. So you need bundler, you'll need a reg test task, and then just use the bundled task to run all the files inside test matching this pattern. And then let's just make that the uh, the default task. And of course, you can also just copy these files from GitHub if you wanted to on your, on your branches. OK, I think it's time to move on to the next part. So if you haven't figured this out, it's no big deal. This part is really basically boilerplate code. I put it in here just so you guys would be familiar with what it actually takes to kind of get this infrastructure up and running if you have never done it before. But if you like, you can keep your work or whatever. But at this point, it's safe to, we can just move on to the next step. So this step is actually the biggest and most complicated part of the, I think, of the workshop <coughs> because it requires us to introduce a lot of concepts in the beginning that we may not understand but are required to actually do the whole TDD process. So if you, if you check out just step two, you'll be you know, at the end of step one. So what we're going to do here is we're going to start to introduce a, like what David has called a system level test. So 
in his keynote, he was talking about kind of not necessarily going full unit test and focusing more on the high level test. Um, so it's actually not so hard to start doing this, but what we're going to need to do is create a high level test that represents somebody sending some input to our system, that going all the way through, and then testing on what comes out of this, basically. So I mentioned that we're going to have a service object, a form, and a repository. And then we also need a model class for this one. But unfortunately, we don't really have these concepts yet in our, in our head. So this probably is challenging. But if you were to s start by writing a blank, just a blank empty test, Imagine what it would look like to say, send some data to something, have something process that data, and then actually enact the change. Now, I invite you to take a guess at what this would look like. Just open a new test file. Say, for example, test, it should create a post. And you send a hash with title and text to something and see what comes out. And you want to have some assertions that uh, there is, in fact, a post or something like that. So this one is actually pretty open to your interpretation. The important thing is just to take a stab at thinking about what these concepts would look like, how you would interact with these things. You know, I doubt you'll come up with what I had. And in fact, if you did, I would be very impressed. And that would be great. But just take a stab at what this would look like. So once again, to iterate, you're going to have at least three different concepts represented in this test that are not actually there in the system yet. You'll have a service object that represents this particular functionality. You'll have a form object that represents the input, and a repository that represents the collection of objects that are going to be managed. You know, So you have at least those three things and some interaction between those. And if what you come up with basically looks like how you interact with the things in Rails, that's totally fine. That's an OK interface. But just you know, take a guess at what something like that will look like. So I just put the three different like, classes or object types that will appear in this test. You know, Just take a stab at how they might be arranged. But these are the things that should be present. So I've just updated the slides to kind of describe how my solution works without showing the code yet. I mean, at the end of this, we'll have a failing test. It will fail because nothing has been defined. I mean, there it will be some assertions, but we'll have a test that fails, and then we can just iterate through that until it's green. Uh, yeah, sure. So just the question was, can you explain some about the repository pattern and why you would use it? So the repository pattern is an excellent way to separate data access and querying sep from how it is stored at the low level. So in this case, we don't have a database yet. We have nothing like that. We don't know what we actually want to use. So for now, it's just safe for us to say we have something that perhaps just stores these objects in memory or whatever. We don't necessarily need to know how. We'll just create an interface to access these things. Then we can implement something that you know, implements the interface in its own, its own different way. Okay, I'm going to pull up the diff here for this one, and we can start to talk about it. So actually, the the diff for this fits on one slide completely, almost. Can everybody see that OK, or should I make it a little bit bigger? Yeah, OK. So we have a class just called post repo. Let's just, we'll use that as a facade to interact with uh, whatever data store we choose. Uh, we have our published post form, just initialize it with a hash of whatever data we'll want to use. And then we'll instantiate this, OK, I call it use case, but service object, whatever, with the form. And then we'll run the use case. And then this has a side effect of actually adding something to the repository, which we can test with um, refute empty. And then at the precondition, we can say assert empty, just so we know that that actually has, in fact, changed something. And we can get the first object from the collection and then test on its values. Okay, so that's yeah, that's pretty much pretty much it. And then yeah, question. Um, yeah, uh, I might be a little blind, but um, you're not injecting the post repo to you. No. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
I don't feel it's really worth it. Sorry? I don't feel it's really worth it to inject that dependency. Okay. Well, uh, uh, why is that? Well, because you, due to the nat due to the nature of it, um, that I can swap out the back end of the repository over the place. So, like when I'm doing tests, I just use the in-memory implementation of persistence. So I don't necessarily care if it talks to that, you know, or even a null implementation. So I don't necessarily need to inject it uh, everywhere. For me, it's just safe enough to say, okay, I just want to access the collection of data. And in certain kinds of tests, I can say that data is just null, or it's in memory, or it is data backed, or whatever. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, another question. Uh, wouldn't the, the repo repository be kind of a, uh, another version, another type of uh, dependency version with like, dependency lookup, kind of? Like, what's up, uh, like, a memory repo for testing or something? Well, we'll see it. Uh, We'll get more into this in the further further down, but uh, just for now, it's just a placeholder for the thing that we'll fill it in. Um, I have a yeah. Is there a reason you didn't make post repo like a instance like you put post repo up first? Like that's a last yeah, it's a single thing. Yeah, um, that's because this is also just due to the fact that you can swap out the back end for these things. So what the constant is there for is it's basically a facade to a larger system. So it's easier, it's easiest to just continually work with that facade as a constant and just use it, use it everywhere. <coughs> yeah, another question. Uh, uh, just as kind of uh, a stylistic issue, I guess. Uh, have you ever sort of thought about using call instead of execute for your sort of, for the use cases? Kind of sort of, sort of, sort of matches the lambda. I had thought about that, yeah. but not necessarily because sometimes this execute method takes is a different signature. In this case, it has no arguments, but usually when I compose the source objects, then they might take a block or another object, which you can't represent with just a line. Right. Uh, and sorry, just one more question. No, just ask away. It's totally fine. <laughs> um, uh, so in terms of like, uh, uh, what, so in terms of uh, injecting the, uh, the form at construction time rather than in terms of the, just passing it to the execute method, what's, what's your sort of decision making process? Yeah, so that's because usually what happens uh, in the constructor phase objects, they take in two things, one being the form and the other being state, which is like the contextual state, which is most likely, most often the current user. And in some cases I found that there is some other um, information that may be passed at execute time and not at instantiation time. It's more of when, if you have a use case where you have to pass these objects around, you may not have the that information when you want to call it. So mm -hmm. when you when you compose it, you can say, okay, here's this thing, and then eventually you can just execute it. So it depends on how you want to interact with the objects. But that's what I found works the best uh, best for here. And in some cases, I've actually created like a, just a class method, just called like post like publish post on execute instead of having to instantiate or then execute. Just depends on kind of uh, uh, the use case. The yeah. I see three different objects in there that haven't been defined anywhere. I'm wondering what their roles are. Yeah. So it's so the the point of this step was just to create something that represents the high level interaction. And of course, these concepts aren't there yet in the code. And actually, what you notice is that the post object. Um, it's, it's not actually referenced by name, it only comes out in post, when you do post repo dot first. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Probably not, actually. Uh, well, I guess, it, it, I'm not sure what the, the, why there's a form on it. I wasn't sure that that was supposed to be Well, yeah, so this is uh, what I mentioned earlier. For this particular example, I'd say it's not needed, right? Like. For this problem domain, this level of separation abstraction is over-architecting. But the only way to demonstrate how it would work is in a very small example. So, yeah. I mean, the, the main benefit of having this separation is that when you have, say, a very complex input that has to be interacted on, and then multiple objects that have to be created or whatever, this is just a way to see what kind of that arrangement will look like. Anybody else have any questions? No? Okay, so let's go back to the slides.
So the first thing we have to do now is actually begin to create these concepts. We run this test, nothing will actually pass. Now, there's implicit dependency between the post repo and the post class itself. So that's the first, uh, the first place to start. So your goal for this step is if you just check out step two, which is this integration test now will exist. Your job is to create a test that you can instantiate an object called post with a hash of title and text, right? And then assert that those things are set. But once we have the domain entity, now we can connect it up to the other things and continue. So if you need questions or help send something up, just ask and like myself or Ed or whoever can come over and give you a hand. And I'll just put an example here on the slide how you can run a, a single test with many tests. So the test you have by doing this you'll have one test for the post and one test for the integration test. Naturally, the integration test won't pass yet. So you maybe want to just run that test that the test you have written is working. So you could just say Ruby test, say, just put this up. Yeah, so for this test, we'll probably just have a test class name, for example, post test, and inside that one method that just instantiates this class, assigns a hash, and then say, you know, to have these things. And now you have to decide how do you want to actually declare that this class should be able to encapsulate this data. You know, what, think to yourself, what is actually the simplest possible way to do that? Yeah, so the directive was to create a, just create a new test file that instantiates an instance of this post class, which you now have to define, and that it is initialized with an hash, and then you just assert that what you had passed in, and now it has those attributes, right? So post.new title this, you know, assert equal, you know, whatever. And then you can run your test file on the command line by just saying Ruby and then path to that test file. Uh, I use keyword arguments when I know there's a small set of things that I actually want, but in this like initialization, initialization case, I don't go with the keyword arguments. Yeah, and then you have just duplication. And also keyword arguments isn't supported on JRuby yet, so. Yeah, I don't know if, I don't, I actually I don't know if they support Ruby 2 yet or whatever, maybe not completely, but. Or Ruby 2 feature. I, th they were, ref I think they were, were ref refined a little bit in 2.1, I'm not sure, I, but yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and skip to the end here on this one. Now we can just go to step. Yeah, so this one I actually did in two steps. Um, so the first one was just to, let's see. Yeah, just create this one simple test. Looks like this, really quite trivial. Um, next thing was just to make it pass, and you can do this by redefining initialize with this hash each pair and with some, uh, Meta programming, you know, it's okay. And then just simple after accessors. You don't you don't really need anything else with anything else than that. Don't need to think about like types or anything. It's just it's just data. So after accessor is completely fine for this. So the next thing I did, this is where I start to use chassis now, just for some little helpers. Look at the final diff from this. And uh, what used to exist inside that custom constructor is replaced by this 
uh, initializable module and chassis. So use that all over the place, so I put it in there. So you write enough of these little classes, you do that stuff all the time, can be encapsulated in a module, and just use it. So does everybody understand what uh, happened in this, in this diff? Yeah? So now this is the point where we actually probably have to, going forward, have to bundle again now, so hopefully the internet is working, or you have a chassis now on your computer uh, locally. So at this, at this point, the integration test is failing because there's still no post repo or things like that, you know? So if we look at step four, we're gonna kind of punt on the post repo for now because we're gonna need the published form. So at this point, you need to create an object that, that is this, this form, basically, and it can, also be initialized with a hash, and it should be able to encapsulate the same, the same data. And at this point, if you want, you can write a test for it, but I don't find that there's really anything so uh, useful to test. So just create an object called publish post form, and it should be initializable with a hash. Not necessarily, so the forms only have one, the forms don't have any other collaborators. So the forms, so this is kind of the unfortunate part about this example is that we can't necessarily illustrate the full power. But what the form objects do are they encapsulate the user input and potentially do uh, coercion and things like that. So for example, like right now we're working with just strings, okay? But let's say that we have uh, like a date or a more complex object, right? this will come across as a string or an integer or God knows what, right? But when we work with this, we want to actually have an instance of time, you know? So for example, if we just pass this junk into the form object, when we call dot date, we get out the date instance, and that's all that we care about. So that's what those things do. Uh, and we'll s and we actually, in a few steps from now, we'll see how we can do, or how they interact with the validation and things like that. Yeah, sanitize model user input for a particular interaction, and the service object gets all of the like input from this particular object, and that's it. What's sort of the equivalent of Rails? There's none. Um, depending on how complex your uh, use case is. So in Rails, we talk about form objects as something that is, um, well, basically mapped directly to an HTML form, right? because uh, there's a lot of problems modeling complex data uh, with HTML forms, usually you have an object that represents it, and that just generates a more complex params hash, maybe, which just gets stumped off to a model or something like that. Um, so the slight difference is in how they're actually used, because when I've, how I've seen them used in Rails is they're really just to make kind of generating the HTML easier, and then that just gets you to the params hash, but you maybe don't interact with that object again. So um, in this case, we only model all of the input to our system with these objects. Yeah, so this one is really straightforward. So uh, I put a hint up there to include chassis.form. This is why I mentioned you guys should at least peruse the gems readme before. And what this basically does, if you haven't used it, is provide more uh, little sugar on top of the virtuous library. Who has used the virtuous library before or know about it? So the virtuous library, for those of you who haven't used it, is a way that kind of does this sanitization and things like this. It basically gives you a way to declare attributes and what types they are and that they should be coerced and things like that. So for example, here, I could replace this with, say, uh, fix num or float, and if I assign a string version of that, it will come out as uh, a float. And you can write your own like coercers for more complicated objects. You know, so if you have say a complicated uh, embedded object or things like that, you can uh, model those easily with uh, with virtuous. And there's nothing really to test because the um, like the initialization initial initialization behavior is provided by the library. So as long as you just have this class, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's enough. So
So we're getting to a point now where we can actually uh, start to make this integration test uh, pass. So if you check out step four, you'll be at the, yeah, sorry, question. Yeah. Okay, so this is a good question. Um, now, the reason why I do the coercion there is because all input goes through those objects. And if you do the coercion in whatever, like validation or whatever at that point, then you never have to worry about where the data is anywhere else. Yeah, poten yeah potentially in this case it would be enough to, uh, to use this in both those cases if this is all the data you have. So you not necessarily have one form for both those interactions. Depending on what data is needed for those interactions, maybe you can use the same object, maybe, maybe not. So the, also the reason why it goes to this one place is because maybe you, like, you rely on the fact that the models, because if you noticed before, we had simple actor accessors in the model, right? They don't worry about anything else, what kind of data types those could be. By going through this one place, we verify that at that point, all the data is correct. So once the data enters our system, we never have to worry about it again. Well, now, after doing this for a long time and kind of knowing what, um, how things tend to develop, I just do this from the very beginning because from my experience, it always approaches the point where I would need to start doing this. So instead of having to like retrofit it into an existing application, it's just easier to start. Um, and the other reason I prefer to do it from the very beginning is when you have the repository, you're not bound to thinking about persistence in any way. You can just work on actually uh, figuring out the interaction between your objects and the public interface that you want. And I find that it works out well. I mean, even if I were to, if I, if I were to write a blog, I may not use this exact thing, because I, I might not have a form, but I would still have at least an object that represents posting this thing and I would definitely use the repository. The thing that might go out first is the form object, because if you just, if you really do have that one-to-one -one mapping between all the things, then perhaps you don't, uh, you know, need to have two. Yeah, so at this point, we're like one step away from being able to get actually to a failing assertion in the integration test. And at this point, the thing that's still not defined is the post repo. So if you had read, uh, the readme in chassis, there's an example of setting up uh, the repository. So the goal for this particular step is to create this post repo and, uh, you know, set it up and you run the test, you should actually get a failing assertion at this point and not a, uh, like, undefined uh, object or whatever. So if you can't access the internet, you can do bundle open chassis and you should be able to see the readme there. What do you mean by micro test? Oh, well it depends. So this is, I think somebody brought up this point earlier about why is it a constant versus an instance. Um, so internally, the repository and chassis is built on top of another concept uh, called a strategy. So the repository, uh, and chassis defines a very basic interface called, you know, like uh, first, last, all, empty, like create, update, delete, whatever. And by default, it also generates a null implementation of that interface that just does nothing. And chassis also defines an in-memory implementation. So for example, in, t in some tests, I can say chassis.repo.use null, I don't even care, you know. Or I can say chassis.use memory. Or so, depending on how I want to run the test, I can also switch it out so I run the entire test suite against uh, a database to see if that's communicating correctly or, or, or not. Does that answer your question? Yeah, we're in the right place now, sorry. Yeah, I hit the arrow key on accident. <laughs> also, if you press the, the mouse button, it still advances the slide. <laughs> When no, actually, uh, when you include chassis persistence, it includes chassis initializable as well. Yeah. Uh, 
But even so, you don't necessarily need to implement that particular part to get this step passing. <laughs> like you're one, st you're one of, uh, you're a couple of steps ahead, but that's yeah. that's good. That's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's just look at the diff here, if everybody's cool with that. Let's see, number five. Yeah, so that's it. Just create this class, extend with this module, and include the pulse repo. Yeah, that's it. So. Um, what the chassis repo delegation module is just setting up some kind of um, helper methods to a more low-level interface. So we are creating a uh, facade object for interacting with the collection of posts. So the next thing to do So at this point, if you're to run the test, you should hit to the point where there's no published post thing and now it can't do the next step. So the next thing is to, okay, guess now check out step five and implement a version of published post that instantiated itself with the form and has an execute method, right? And then you should get a new failing assertion. All right, and just again, don't worry about what goes inside that execute method. Just get it so when you run test, now you should get like, I don't know. Yeah. Some something else. I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember the next the next error or the next playing assertion. In the yeah yeah yeah. Basically, what we want to do is just we write write the test, and then maybe it fails for some class we haven't defined. Okay, we just put that there. We just keep going until we get to an actual assertion and not an error, and then make that assertion pass. So then, at that point, what you should see is expected post repo not to be empty because the use case hasn't actually done anything to create this post. You know. What time is the workshop and is it 4.10 or 4.20? Do you guys know? Oh, 4.30, okay. Yeah, so this one is particularly pretty easy. The only thing that maybe you haven't seen before is this little micro gem called uh, Concord, which is basically a way to create um, Mm. It's the equivalent of say writing of writing def private form and setting an instance variable named form in the initializer. So when you write do that ten thousand times, you don't want to deal with it again. Yeah. Yeah. So it basically defines a private actual reader named form. Just a heads up on, Con on Concord, you can also pass an array or up to three different arguments. So you could say uh, concord.form and then current user or whatever, what have you. So now the next thing to do is actually implement that logic. Um, so if you were to check, if you check out step six now, I believe, is that where we're on? Make it pass now, pretty much. So you mean you have you have the date like so? I'm glad that Ed actually mentioned the chassis persistence thing because you will need that. You have the form which models all the data, okay? You have the post object which has this initializer. You can assign the things, and by including chassis persistence, now it responds to save an interface that you're probably familiar with. Just got to plug in a few lines inside the execute method and. You, 
you can check out step six if you want to. Okay. Oh, out of habit at this point, because I have, when you, as you, I don't know if you have attend, if you attended the Sandy Metz talk, but you know, if you, as you begin to create more and more objects, more classes that encapsulate their own private state, it becomes annoying to have like definitionalize with a val with a val a value and then assign an instance variable and then do def private so on and so on. So perhaps for this particular workshop it might have been a mistake, but this is just now my habit uh, at this point. So you can also refer to the chassis readme for the things added by the persistence. But basically what it will do is connect the post to the post repo and supply a few methods. So at this point, you should be able to run bundle exec rake and all of the tests should pass if you've implemented it correctly. So I see in here in your step uh, six branch, you actually included both oh good and the Unix live for the other person. Oh really? Looking at the source? Uh, no, no, again, it's not just looking at how you implement and execute. Um, is there like a, a way to like do mass assignment? No. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, actually, you. In, okay. Yes, actually, because like what you, which we, the first thing that we, what we had written in the very beginning was definitionalize hash whatever. That's still there. You can still just dump in your hash or do whatever. Got it. So in, in the same thing holds true for dot create as well. Right? Yes. So then could we really just do like post dot create form? What would that not work? Not with an instance of form because that would it doesn't know what that is, right? Oh, it doesn't know the okay. It doesn't know of like all the attributes on. on right. The dot but if you happen to if you if you do happen to know that virtuous doesn't know the dot attributes method. Right. You could say post.create form yeah. attributes. Right. 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 Okay. Yeah. So yeah. That would work in this particular case, but I don't mm -hmm. I don't uh, advise to yeah. think like that. Oh, it's too Rails or no, it's not too Railsy, it's just in um, um, you have to be aware that the input that you collect from the user does not necessarily map one to one with how you interact with your domain entities and what perhaps the what the server software actually does, you know. If it happens to be able that you could yeah. just like pass a hash around, then that is just the coincidence, really. So in some cases you could use like hashes, you know, but that's not necessarily a thing that you should consider. Like I should just be able to dump hashes everywhere, because it's not necessarily productive in the long run. Yeah, but I thought you said that the form object was there to kind of do that. No, not necessarily the post model. See, right? Because so th this is again like why this thing is kind of a bad example because there is that mapping, you know. But let's say, for example, we're talking about like a shipment order that perhaps has like three or four things, and there's a bunch of coordination processes. Maybe you're creating like five models. Maybe you're sending emails, you know. So. Right. Yeah. Right. So like, if you happen to have say a like an address or something on a form, right? It's probably okay that you could pass it off as a hash, but maybe you have some like 
some permissions and maybe you would send emails like you need to index stuff in different services, you know. It's just yeah. Basically it's domain it's domain specific, you know. Why in this step um, are you explicitly declaring the title and the text to match the form instead of going through each of the attributes in the form? Say that again? So like in this step, in this pull request. Um, Which one? Hold on, let me just bring up the disk so we can look at it there. So now we're on what, number seven? seven. Yep. So instead of iterating, so then just do it, instead of just doing an iteration through the attributes that you declared in the form, you're explicitly stating them here. Yeah. For any reason. Um, Yes, that's so that comes back to my point there about not necessarily like yes it'd be possible in this case but not thinking about it. Okay. So like if I were to if I were to say, okay, let's just use attribute attach and assign it there, yeah. then okay, then maybe that's what you guys take away from this. Sure. But uh, I do I pretty much do it this way now in all of the cases, um, because there is not the direct mapping and and um, perhaps I need to interact with this data uh, Beforehand, before assigning it somewhere, like okay. um, you just have to make the you know make the decision based on what you what you need to do. But the reason I put it like this is just to kind of show you that don't necessarily think like that. Like just take the piece of the parts of the data you need and then put them where you want. Mm -hmm. So this this form object can actually encapsulate like multiple objects inside of it. Right. Like, like you were saying, like maybe like there's date stuff and then or address. And then also like those. Yeah. Um, so then, like, the the parallel in Rails would that just be like a set of nested attributes, or like? Uh, kind of, right? Because the, when you use the nested attributes, you only get the hash. Like, you uh, you have um, like an array of hashes or just a hash that gets assigned to uh, like the model of the thing receiving it responds to like you know, comments, attributes, right. equals hash, right? right. Mm -hmm. But in this case, you would have, say, a, like a comments collection or something, a higher level uh, concept. So to give you an example, I'll just show you uh, something else here. So this is a, um, this is what I, where I work now. It's a classified site, okay? But um, when you actually, like, post, a class, post an ad on our site, you can sign up for account, and there's a bunch of actually other models inside that. So there's an ad, there's properties, there's a contact card, there is accounts, there is passwords, right? Now, it may not look obvious like at this point, but there's a lot of stuff. If we were to fill this in, you have to input all of that different data. And all of that data is encapsulated with one single form called post ad form. But inside that, there is an ad form, there is a contact details form, there is an account form, there's all of these different things. Mm -hmm. And then the use case then interacts with those individual parts of the data, and then you know maybe it creates a record, maybe it does something else. Yeah. So the, the real power of this is that you can have multiple, like multiple types of forms. Right. And that's the that that's the real thing to take away from uh, from the workshop is that um, these techniques are really only useful when applied to a certain level of complexity because you will not see any you know, real benefit if this is, you know, the only thing that, you, that you're working with. But when you do have, like, more complex data, like nested things that have to be transmitted and, you know, then this can really be powerful. Yeah? Do you find value in using these patterns in a legacy application? Um, do you mean, like, inserting them into a the legacy application? So you're, you're maintaining and you're building on top of an application that wasn't created with these patterns. Is there value in that? Um, I have found that there is some there is some value, uh, depending on what people know about the application itself, um, and um, it. Of course, the answer is it depends. Um, sometimes it's just simply too hard to do it. But I have found that there is some value in isolating the other parts. Of the th of the things like if you if it is like for example you know in a, a Rails application maybe there's some gigantic controller maybe you know 
what happens is at some point you need to say, um, I need to use the behavior from this one app from this controller in some other place, right? You need to compose some behavior. So if you're able to extract the logic out of that one controller, you could then test it and then reuse it in another place. I find that most of the, most of the benefit in the legacy applications uh, comes from being able to encapsulate the data access. That's I, what I've found in Rails applications, that's the thing that's most easily abused, is you have like active record API calls everywhere or mongoid API calls. Yes, Declan. Yeah, I was gonna add like, a, the, the question that you just asked was exactly what motivated me to kind of go down this road as well. And, and, and the scenario was, I wanted to share, I was writing a new API on top of an existing Rails app which had a ton of technical debt. I wanted to build an API and not have to um, repeat all of the mistakes I made while building the app in the first place. So I kind of followed these patterns and pulled pulling code out of the uh, of, of a legacy app and then reusing it in the API and having you know, removing the duplication. So I didn't I didn't approach it with the intent of improving the legacy app, but I, I approached it with the intent of um, using these techniques to pull out the common pieces and uh, and, and, and make them testable and. and um, Higher quality code. So. And you had success with that? S still on that journey, but so far, yeah. yeah. And it depends too, because in, I've, I get this question a lot, and there, there is a certain amount of prerequisites that you have to have in the code base before applying these things kind of make sense. Because this assumes that you're able to kind of isolate those concerns, and in what do we call legacy applications, usually that is not there. So there's a bunch of prerequisite steps you have to do. Um, one really good example is uh, my friend of mine is putting together a book called Rails Refactoring, and he steps through like refactoring controllers and a bunch of these things, and it gets you into a point where you can start to apply these different approaches. Yeah. So we were. Yeah. There. So that's it. Like if you were to run the test now at this point, everything passes. You know. Granted, like it's really quite trivial, but it does pass. Sorry, in, in, uh, I guess if I looked at the persistence code, maybe I would understand better, but where is the thing actually getting created right now? Is it, is it just a memory? Like yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, basically, the, by default, uh, the, the, uh, like I mentioned earlier, there's a few package implementations, but it uses a memory-based implementation, which basically just stores everything uh, in a hash. Okay. So, and like, where do you put that hash? It's like a class variable or something? Or no, it's just an instance. An instance. Yes. Uh, sorry, I must have missed something. Uh, in terms of how's how's the post getting into the post repo? Yeah. So if you hitting so, so I, I did a bit of a different implementation. Where uh, okay. I, where I actually uh, I created the the, the, the new post instance yeah. uh, and then called save on the repo. Yeah. Yeah. By, that's by yeah. passing it. In. Yeah, that works as well. So the only the only difference is that uh, chassis repo defines save to delegate to post repo. So for example, when you include chassis persistence in a post class, mm. if you call save, it will look for the matching thing that has repo at the end of it. Gotcha. And, then, and okay. then call save. Okay. So that's 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 it. Okay. So yeah, yeah, you did it you did it the way the the the, the low, low level way. So Okay. So you know, applause to you, sir. <laughs> well, yeah, because I was going through the documents like so that the well the readme doesn't kind of talk about how those, well I guess it does, maybe I didn't read it very well. I yeah. Probably it doesn't because I haven't been able to like communicate all of my in Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, just, I just opened up the, right. the delegation so, class and saw the same thing. Yeah, so like now, yeah, so now that you saw the delegation class, you kind of understand what that's doing. Because the post, uh, the, the public interface to the repository, like everything either has an instance of, a, an instance of something or a class and an ID, right? So for example, Repository, find me post with this ID, right? And what the repo delegation thing does is, okay, I have named post repo, so I will just insert post in all of the correct places. So I can say post repo dot find and not have to worry that there is this other argument being passed around. I'm interested in your design decision on that in terms of um, uh, why not sort of show explicitly that you're adding it to the repo. Because it, 
gets really annoying. Like when you, it, de it depends on how much data access you do. Like if you just have to do say find for example, but where this becomes really powerful, which unfortunately we won't be able to get to in, in this workshop, is when you define quarries, right? Um, like a custom quarry. So for example, um, in my blog I talk about if you say, I want to find all the popular posts, right? You, on your post repo, you could define a metric called uh, like popular or whatever, mm -hmm. which then makes a low level call to do, you know, to do that interaction. Whereas if you didn't, you'd have to say, okay, now I need to go in my use case, I need to go to the, whatever the repo is, I need to call quarry with this class and this like quarry object. Yeah. That just kind of eliminates that boilerplate. And recently I had to do some, uh, I wrote a repository to interact with the legacy data source and I needed to interact it with the low level during the test and after writing a bunch of tests I got so sick of, of, of that. So, but it's there, but it's much easier to, to work with like this facade, I, I found. Um, uh, does create uh, accept a hash? Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. So, so you've gone kind of like explicit, but you could have called form dot attributes to pass into the create. Right, yeah. I mean, okay. the initial, so basically initializable that makes things behave the same way that like active record or active model. Right. So you can pass in a hash and then they, you can pass in a block which yields itself. Okay. Yeah, so the next step, so if you were to check out step seven, the next thing to do is we're gonna handle a bad input case. So implementing validations. So this is, this is one place that I found where having a form object really starts to shine because as, you, as your application grows, you'll have more and more complex validation concerns, right? That may be like context-free validations like is the title more than three characters, you know, or whatever. But then perhaps you have more context like, okay, I am the current user. They're logged in, they have some permissions, like maybe there's these other things, you know. And um, you can kind of encapsulate that stuff in the form and allow the form to be manipulated by a service object which kind of encapsulates this stuff. So what we're gonna do in this step is take the existing integration test case, add another test that says you basically call this thing with uh, an empty form and that um, some failure mode should happen, right? You get to decide at this point what that failure mode actually is, but the fact of the matter is if I try to put a form that has nothing into this source object, either there should be an exception, there should be something, but nothing should happen, right? So a hint here for this one, I'll just put it on here. So you have to take a stab at defining what the validations, like what an interface for validations will look like. And remember at this point, you can't think in of say active model validations or anything like that. It's up to you. You have to implement this particular functionality uh, yourself in whatever interface that uh, you, know, you see fit. So just to iterate on this, reiterate on the structure, the form encapsulates the validation. The service object will ask the form, hey, are you valid or something? And it will do something, right? That's kind of up to you to decide. And how do we clear the repo again? We need to do the teardown, right? Uh, yeah, but I added that, if you had checked out my branch, oh, it's right. there. Or if you just add like def teardown, you can say, uh, I'll just put it on the slide here case you haven't done it. And that there is what all the everything, you know. So it's like total total reset.
you, do you, so you put the validation on the form, not on the published post? Yes. Okay. Because uh, for this case, this, I, this, this is what I mentioned, the difference between context-free and contextual validations. In all, in all systems, there is always some context-free validations. Like for example, this uh, post form always requires a title and a text, right? The form encapsulates that validation. That's there all of the time. And then in the published post, perhaps you check to say, okay, maybe there's, maybe a bad example, but there's too many published posts right now, right? You can't access the information in the form. So my question is, is like, so the way that I'm, I've been thinking about this is kind of like uh, the, I guess, published posts more or less access some type of model type thing, right, where you can do the execute and you can like actually say it's the media. So like in Rails, you put most of your model, you would put your model validations inside the model. Um, so where exactly, so if you're trying to put the validations in the form, how do you stop it? Don't get it into the, the published post, like because you can just you can just pass it whatever form you want in the published post, right? Yeah. Like, where exactly do you put these validations in that published post? Well, that's well, for you to find out. Oh, okay. <laughs> but if you're if you, if you're thinking about say instantiating this object with a different form in terms of a real life application, that should never ever even be. Right? Because you're never, let's say that you were to expose this to the web, right? It's not possible for you to like create some form that can be different an object and pass it into there. I mean, the point of adding the, point of adding the validations is that the um, behavior that the published post object should do should not happen if the given form is invalid. Right, so you're going to need at least, like, you need one, to, so you need the integration test that says, okay, I'd send this blank form to the service object and, you know, something should happen. Then that creates a need for the unit test. So you need a unit test for the form that says this is an invalid case. So, for example, this, you know, if the title is given but there's no text, it should be invalid and the opposite, you know, the opposite way around. So. Like in the integration test, you don't necessarily have to be concerned about all of the potential different ways validation can fail. You just can create a failure case and then specify those behaviors uh, with unit tests. So you have a few options, you know, maybe inside your publish, uh, the publish post class, you can say, okay, hey, form, are you valid? Then return no or something, right? You can treat it as an exceptional, uh, exceptional case. Perhaps you return some sort of error object, I don't know, right? But you just have to determine some interface uh, for that. So, yes, question? Yeah. Um I'm just thinking from like a, uh, so this is kind of like validating attributes. What about, uh, what about actual business rules? What's your sort of approach to that? Do you still keep, do you put those in the actual domain object? Uh, yes, in some cases. So uh, from what I've, what I, so you've mentioned the third validation case, okay? So you have the context-free validations, you have contextual ones, and then you have these sort of business level violations. Like for example, let's say that you had an order um, order class that cannot exist without a billing information or something like that. Inside the... Uh, well, well, actually, maybe it's like, uh, maybe like when you're trying to ship an order, uh, but it hasn't been paid for. So you're, yeah, so you're kind of triggering this ship yeah, on the uh, Yeah, so then in that case, I'd have this kind of contextual, like this either contextual or whatever you want to call it, business uh, rule validator that would exist in the concept of the ship order service object. And in the service object? Yeah. So you have, um, a, so you have the, the so validations right. on the form, and then whatever kind of business rules exist for that particular thing, right. a class inside the service object that... Um, 
encapsulates that information. Right. But then, I mean, but then you domain, like you really don't have a domain model anymore. You just have a, a, a data structure that represents a domain concept. I mean, it's not really, like there's no logic. Well, not necessarily. It depends because um, on how those objects interact. Like, for example, I had a, um, a case where you have an object that has a, like an, an action log, for example, all of the things that had been done to this, and there is a defined, um, a defined set of interactions. So this was like a review, and it had a log object, and the log, the log object implemented those methods to call, okay, this person approved it, this person received it, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and that begins to create a more richer domain model to interact with, which can be used by the service objects and the other things that collaborate these objects. So I tend to like, coalesce a lot of like that kind of logic that you're that you're talking about inside the service objects particular or used for that particular interaction. So the like the model classes are usually usually just data and then more higher semantic access to the data. So what sort of, I mean, do you end up in, uh, what sort of custom methods do you end up adding to your domain, uh, to, your, to, uh, to your domain? Well, that's so like um, potential state transition things. Mm -hmm. um, associations yeah. go there, like interacting with say, like a, a comments collection or associated like billing information, mm -hmm. um, things like that. Basically, things that operate on the data, pretty right. much it. Yeah. And then something else will control the access to that. But, I, I, but, to, but like if, you're, if you're pulling out the business rules, aren't you, from the, business, from, the, from, the, from the domain model, the business object, I mean, you're essentially sort of breaking encapsulation at that point, right? Mm. I think it depends on where you want to define it. I think it just defines where you want the information to live. I mean, I have found that. But I mean, if the business rule is validating, like business rules typically, you know, well, I mean, they can surely can validate attributes, but more in terms of validating collaborations with other objects, again, coming back to this idea of, of, um, of shipping an order, it shouldn't be shipped before it's paid for. Um, the, the order object knows if it's. Okay, if it should ship right, so. Right. so one then you, sorry, because then, then you would sort of have to ask, hey, order are you paid for? Um, and oh, you are, okay, then I can ship. Shouldn't you really just say, hey, I want to ship this order, and the order will say, hey, well, you can't, because it'll take you. Okay, 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 yes, okay. In that case, usually I do put that logic on those okay. objects themselves, right? Okay, cool. So, right. yeah, so kind of confused there. So one of the other things that um, comes up is that you have some also domain level, like business level invariants. Right, like you can't have an order without a billing. So inside the um, those objects, I will just check to see if those things are set. Right, not necessarily anything else, you know, because in some cases, you like there have the public information that is like assignable or whatever, and then perhaps what should happen to eventually create some objects, mm -hmm. and then those objects have their own invariants which are not publicly accessible. So you have to put in some checks into those objects to ensure that. The things that are collaborating with them do, in fact, instantiate them the right way. Right. Because it means like an order, like a, an order should have at least an order, one order line. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. So th that kind of stuff, I have no problem putting um, putting in there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's a great question. And what having gone down, I'm not nearly as far along as Adam is, but in down this, what I found, and I, I was asked, asked Bob Martin the same question I think you just asked. And what what. He's noticed, I think it's a lot like what Adam's saying, is that the, um, the, the domain entities, if you will, end up being somewhat anemic in terms of behavior other than, say, data type things. And then when you have business rules, they tend to evolve into like policy objects mm -hmm. or other things. So the business rules are still in the domain, but they may not be in the specific entities. Um, and, um, that's not something that I intentionally did, but as things got refactored, that's kind of where the design, in my case, seems to be headed, and it kind of makes sense. So if you've got business rules around 
um, you know, it should be, you know, uh, you can't order it and have it shipped in the past or something like that, then, you know, that could be a policy or, or access, um, particular users are able to do one thing but not another, that would be a policy and that kind of makes sense. So the res responsibility of enforcing that business rule is, is, is really like a policy decision in, Rather than being embedded yeah, in the but, entity. But the, the, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is though that the order should be responsible for enforcing that policy because that policy might change, and that and all the other business objects interacting with that order shouldn't know, shouldn't know if that shouldn't know the reason for uh, the order not wanting to ship, right? Because right. it might it might that that might change over time. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So one one example is that well, you yeah. shouldn't ship it in the order. Uh, sorry, sh shouldn't ship it in the past. But you should certainly not ship that. Uh, it shouldn't ship if it's um, uh, if it hasn't been paid for. Yeah. Right. But those can, that policy might that right. policy might change. Yeah. So so the and the order knows yeah. why that. Yeah. And it, it and actually of course it depends on the complexity of such policies. Like if that's the only rule, then of course you know perhaps they can live there. But if you have the more complex right. policies, then. Maybe right. we need a policy object, and now we're really getting more into like DCI and those kind of right. things. Right. You know? But, but I, I guess it would be like you could still have a policy object, but the order should be delegated. Yeah. To that policy right. object. So it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be like just picked up by some random. Right. Object. So for example, I'd have the same thing when it comes to permissions. So I have a basically yeah a, a policy that um, represents what the thing can and can't do, and that is passed around to the um, um, like to the very parts of the system that need to be aware of these things. Okay, Thanks. so let's yeah, get back on uh, track. So where were we? We're now on this one. So it's almost like half an hour left, so I think I'm gonna pick it up now and kind of take more control over where we're going. <laughs> um, just because I want to be able to show you guys how this inter integrates with Rails, and I don't know if you guys have the like, low-level experience to kind of hook wire these kind of things up. Um, so for this one, for these validation cases, I prefer to handle these as uh, invariants, kind of in a way. So I treat validation failures as actual error, error conditions. So for example, in the um, uh, post form, define a method called validate, and then just say fail validation error, title blank, and less title, so on and so forth. Very trivial implementation of what it looks like. Um, and then up inside uh, the app, the RB file, just declare this validation error constant that I can use. And then the source object just calls form.validate, so an invariant at the top of the, basically at the top of the method. Um, and then in the test, we can just say it assert raises this particular error and go on about our business. The reason I prefer to do this is when you create like the delivery mechanism, it's easier to capture the different failure, uh, different failure modes of the particular interactions. Also, I never expect an interaction to fail. Like if I were to instantiate this class and call it, I don't want to be aware that there might be a particular failure thing that could happen. But of course, you have to be aware of that if you're going to say compose them. You know, but say for example in tests or when you reuse this class in different places, um, having like validation errors and things return like false, for example, can be very problematic in the long run. That's why we have things like save bang in active record, right? So if you just need to make sure something is there, you always have to be sure that you do this, otherwise it just might not happen silently. So I found that this works pretty well across multiple implementations and multi uh, multiple applications. Uh, yeah, so then here is your, okay, and set up, yeah, it did it here. Because at this point, when you have two tests, you do have to actually uh, wipe the state from the previous one. So at this point, if you were to check out, um, yeah, step nine, you would have like a fully functional system. So you could create a post, and you could have handle a potential uh, error case. Now, at this point, we could connect our application up to, say, the web or anything like that. So this is where it starts to get um, more complicated. Uh, so I did it in step. Yeah. Actually, uh, yeah. In step nine. 
So this is a, like a really big commit because Rails was introduced here. But what happens is due to the nature that Rails takes over so much of your project structure and things like that, instead of fighting it, I basically just gave up and accepted it. So what happened is all the files that we had in app have been moved into lib slash domain and what was app is now lib slash domain. And there's an initializer that requires lib slash domain, right? So all of our domain code is just loaded at, uh, at boot time. Um, and then is, let's see here. So yeah, require domain, and then if we just keep going. All right, now we have lib domain, and we have just moved those into lib domain, and things continue to work. Now the one thing to remember here that if you do do this, that code is not auto-loaded. Right? You have to require it up front. So that does also create something you have to be aware about if you're going to separate it like that. One option would be to say, put these, like create some say like app slash posts, app slash forms, so, so on and so forth, and those classes uh, would be auto-loaded. However, the reason why I didn't do this is because you may need some classes that now exist in the framework context only to say kind of adapt and connect your classes into however it is you want to serve them up, which is what we'll see going forward. So, yeah, just add Rails, nothing has changed. You can still run the tests, and they still pass. So you could check out this branch on, yeah, if you were to check out, check out step 10, you could bundle this like rake, and it would still be the same. Um, so the next thing to do is add a failing acceptance test for the user interaction. So at this point, we can say, okay, now I have this form object, I need to be able to go to some web page, type in the title and the text, hit publish, and then, you know, my post should be saved. Uh, in practice, do you uh, do that main spacing, that domain, at all? Other way around. Other way around? Other way around, yeah. So I have, like, my, we'll, we'll see this in the next, in the, in the oh. next step. Um, so what I've done in this particular pull request is just test that I can visit some URL and type in these things and it happens. And this happens with Capybara. So how many people here have used Capybara before? Anybody? Okay, so you're familiar with it. So basically we hit our route here, we visit this and we fill in the things and like that's pretty much it. Then I'll just require Capybara Rails and insert the DSL here, right? Now we could run this test and you would hit a fill in insertion because this, I should, oh, I'm actually on my computer. I'm sorry, I thought I was looking at the, uh... yes, okay, so, sorry about that. Uh, so we have our published post test, and it just visit this thing, you know, like you would expect, fill in these things, hit the button, and then we should just see what we filled in there on the page. And then just require Capybara Rails in the test helper, also note that the previous test helper was erased by the Rails 1, so that's, that's there, and then just include the Capybara DSL. So you run this, it fails because this thing does not exist, right? So this is where it starts to become more interesting in terms of what you have to do. So the next one, so this is the complete implementation of that interaction inside uh, Rails. So. Okay, so I'm removing some things. Um, so create the controller. Inside new, we're going to instantiate this form object so we can actually, in hindsight, I didn't use it um, in the view yet. But the important thing to pay attention to is the create action, which basically looks like the same thing you had in your test. So what we're talking about here is Rails as a concept of a delivery mechanism. So in the concept of like, hexagonal and the separation of these things, you have your domain and then something that is used to make that accessible in some particular context. So in this context, we're using Rails for this. So in here, the post controller is our delivery mechanism. Now, of course, the published post has no idea what the particular user interface should be like for this interaction. It's up to the delivery mechanism to decide that. So in this case, we just say, okay, we'll redirect to post path and then use the repository to find it and render it. Now, here I have just punted on the Rails form stuff, 
because Rails does require you to insert a lot of um, conventions into the objects to work with the form helpers. So just kind of went around that and added, you know, the low level stuff. So no form for thing, just writing the HTML uh, ourselves. And then we have the show template, which just renders the post information to the screen. Okay, routes. Uh, yeah, okay, had to change those here. But that's, um, that's really all it took to get that passing. So you could check out this and run the test and it would, um, would pass. But we've only actually, in, in, at this point, only implemented half of the application's functionality because we know that they could only, they could not fill in those things and of course the domain now would raise an exception which has to be handled. So that's what we do in the next, uh, I gotta do it over here every time. So for this one, same thing. Um, yeah. So in this one, creates a exceptions test for the delivery mechanism such that it can handle this particular error case. So I'll just visit the thing, press the button, and then just say that, okay, the error should be displayed, you know? So this actually exposed an interesting thing that I continually forget about every single time I interact with uh, HTML forms, is that if you fill in a, if you don't fill in a form, you don't get nil in params, you get an empty string. Right? So, found that out because for us, we just say return unless title, but an empty string is truthy, so it passes validation. So in this case, updated the unit test to say, okay, now this particular validation case is handled, and update the form. Did I do it in this one? Yeah. So you can say um, title.2s.strip.empty. This happens to work because nil can be coerced into an empty string, Strip removes all the white space and empty checks to see if it's one to one. So this is pretty much exactly what blank is doing in this case. You know. So found that out and um, it works. So hopefully you wouldn't actually have to change the domain in this case, but since we had found a, um, a new failure case, we have to account for that. Now, uh, yeah. So any questions about this stuff so far? No? Okay. So I will show you, there's two things left we have to cover. Um, and I did, the reason I did it like this, uh, with this, just the basic, yes? Uh, yeah, just got one. Um, so when you're validating, uh, you, you raise an exception if the title's not playing. Uh, what, what about if uh, the title and the text is not playing? then you won't, it will short circuit that, right? You won't get a, an error. Yeah, on so this was the most basic thing that could possibly work for this particular example. Okay. But when I do it in practice, I use a more complex like validation scheme, so you can actually collect the right. failures okay. and not just abort at the beginning. Okay. Yeah? What are your thoughts on the inclusion of like active model in your formal check? If that's how you want to implement validations, then that's good, you know, go for it. You know? that would allow you to See, that part I disagree with. Like if you want to implement the validations, let's say active model validations, that's fine. That's like context free, you know. Right. But if you want to say, add the like active model naming and things like that, then I disagree because then the domain is aware of a particular delivery mechanism concept. Okay, so you think the, the, the trade-off of the, the helpers you can get don't outweigh the, the maintenance of the, the objects? Not exactly, so that's what I'll show you uh, now. So the reason I did this is this was the simplest thing that could work without having to understand that all the things you have to add to get it to work with the Rails form helpers. So I don't know if you guys have done that before. So I did this earlier, and I opened this, let's just go over here. Yeah, so I like the Rails form helpers. I would like, I would, I would prefer to use them if I could, because the problem with this also implementation is that those values would be, you know, the user interface would display nothing where they had previously put. Yeah. So, 
Um, and this is come back to your initial question about namespacing. So instead of namespacing the domain, I namespace on the delivery mechanism. So for example, the rail stuff that is particularly used to connect these classes is now namespaced in the uh, the web names is now in the web namespace. So I have created this um, web publish post form that is implemented as a delegating class, right? So what it does is wrap the existing like domain concept that we use and add all of the uh, Rails specific wiring to get everything uh, to work. So I'm not sure if you guys have seen the delegate class before, but it basically creates a copy of just the public instance methods to fund that particular object and exposes them. And you have to instantiate it with an instance of that object. So instead of subclassing, Right? If the particular object had a bunch of functionality from the superclass, you don't pull that in. You only get the, say, the title equals and the text equal things. So then you include the active model uh, naming thing to make it all work. And then, yeah, this is needed for, I don't know, some reason. But uh, nil is good enough for us. Something to do with some, I don't know, generating URLs or something like that. But since we can't generate those manually anyway, we just have to pass it in here, right? And now we can call f.textField and f.textArea and whatever. The only thing missing from this is that you don't have the active model errors. However, you could, if you wanted to, say, write an adapter for your domain things and translate them into this if you, know, if you wanted to. Depends on the use case. Like for us right now, it's okay. We just have simple error message and you know, that's all. But um, yeah, and then this also changed because now it's inside web, then it's called this, the IDs are this. And then up in the uh, controller, now we have to say web publish post form and then web publish post form, right? And it seems to work, like, I haven't done this so much in the context of Rails, but you could probably encapsulate that particular thing in some module or something like that and, you know, I think it would work out well. The only thing to do was the, um, potentially the errors, but that depends particularly on the application, how you want to display them and what kind of requirements you have in the domain and it's, um, it's kind of hard to make a decision there. I have I have actually have stopped using the active model validations particularly because of how they, the error collection is limiting. Because if you have nested objects, which I tend to work with a lot, you can't say pass down an error collection into a nested thing and kind of collect all of those things. Active model errors expects each object to have its own error bucket, but that doesn't necessarily work for a lot of my use cases. So, anybody have any last questions about uh, about this? No. Okay. So we have about 20 minutes left, and we have. The last remaining like bit of this thing, which is now how to connect this to persistence, right? Now, this will be like even more over architecting and even more like duplication, but the point is just to illustrate that yes, you can do it. Um, and I have a bunch of information and a bunch of topics on how to do this particular bit. This, this is a whole nother topic. Um, so, yeah. So this is actually the first, the first time I have implemented um, persistence for a repository using active record. Usually I use SQL because I don't, work in, I don't work inside of Rails. And I find that SQL is actually more powerful than active record in terms of the query interface. So there is a lot of boilerplate code kind of going on here because you have to know internally how to create your own adapter or your own, your own repository implementation with your chassis and some things like that. But basically how it boils down to is you treat active record as a row data gateway, right? So um, what I have started with is define a class called post row and then just self table name equals post. If, you know, don't need to have post rows table in your database. Um, and also do it here because if you, active record kind of assumes that all of the uh, objects are in the global namespace. Yes. Sorry, I was just to say something on the screen. Oh, god damn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so I'm so sorry. Um, Thirteen. Thank you. Maybe I should just like mirror something now, but we're almost done. Anyway, so you have this class post row, right? So it's just 
an abstraction with that one particular row in the database and say Seth table name equals post because you know don't want to have a post rows table in the database that would just be stupid. Now I would prefer to implement this like namespace this particular object inside web, but then Active Record kind of goes wonky because it expects this object to be the global namespace. And since we have our own concept of what a global post is, we have to call it something else. So this is starts to have where kind of the quote magic happens, but I wouldn't recommend doing this kind of implementation. So we have our active record repo, which subclasses the chassis base repo. And there's some boilerplate into kind of to get all these things wired up. But essentially what it boils down to is you have inside you have a mapper which is responsible for managing a particular class of objects. And I've kind of just short circuited that because we only have one in this particular case. So we have clear, which will just do destroy all, just wipe everything. And we have create, which will just take the attributes from the post and create a new post row and save it. And the most important thing is now you have to assign this ID, right? So it makes, it makes sense. And then just return uh, the record. Now, empty, to see if there's any rows in the database. And all, so kind of a sort circuit here, just loop over all of these things, call my favorite thing, bag of hashes, pass it around, and instantiate a new domain object. Uh, and then it happens to work, we don't have to implement, say, like first and those kind of things, because by default it will just call all.first. So you can, it's fine. And then get, which just looks at the thing by ID, and then does post.new uh, row attributes, and then some boilerplate code. But essentially what you have to do is something that instantiates, you know, writes a row to a database, and then with the right data, and then gets it back. So then here in the initializer, we can say I want to register an implementation of the repository using my active record repo. And then we're going to say I'll just use that. So swap the memory implementation for uh, the active record based persistence. And that will just affect everything. You know, but as I mentioned earlier, you could say in CI, I will run against active record or you know, whatever it is that you wanted. And then now we actually have to create a migration to do these things, you know, to add this stuff to the table. And then we get the schema stuff, and okay, clear. And if you run the tests, everything will still pass. So you all didn't have to change any other concepts, you just swap this object on the end, and the whole system is now a winter. Just uh, is the definition for the active record repo? Yeah, sure. Oh, I see. Oh, I can. Yeah. Oh, but that, but that minus, but that's specifically for posts, right? Right. So this is what the mapper does. So, uh, and this is why the class argument is passed down to the repo because then the mapper could say implement a RDMS mapper for one thing, a uh, like a Redis for something else or whatever. So, yeah. But if you had more than one model, yeah, what would it look like? Would it get like? Because you're configuring it saying there's only one active repo, repo right? Uh, yeah. So that's so yeah. That, that's the purpose of the uh, of the mapper. So you would. Oh, so, okay. So right. So you could say, given I, this comes in, I use this thing and I use that. So in practice, depending on like your particular implementation, say you might have uh, a mapper for each particular object type, right? But the in for the, the in memory mapper just is a hash, it just inserts a new thing into a hash based on the class, right? So uh, it's simple, but in practice I found that you end up creating like a mapper for each particular type of object you want to persist, which is just how I've done it. But most people have been asking me, okay, how do I create like, say I want my post to be in Redis, right? Or I want this to just be there. You can do that as well. You can just change the repository that that delegation thing uses. There's nothing that says you only have to use one instance of repository. This is just how I've been using it. And that actually, that sums up mm, all of there is. So I mean, at this point, you have everything, like it works. Uh, we have active record for persistence. We're using Rails to deliver it. We use the Rails form helpers. And um, I mean, Granted, it's kind of janky at this point, you know? Like, I, I completely admit that this is not good code, right? 
but it's just an, a way to kind of show you how this would be arranged. And the one thing I do want to caution you against is that in terms of the duplication, that if you do implement stuff like this, and then you have your, uh, God, like your migrations, like things, you know, you have a lot of duplication. So there's some strategies I've found to deal with that, and I'd be happy to talk to, uh, to talk about them later. Um, but does anybody have any questions about this stuff? You just have a few more minutes. Yeah, what, so you, you, you're using this kind of hexagonal, what do you call it, hexagonal? Yeah. You're using this in, in a real production application. Oh, yeah. What, what size team are you, are you using? Because one of the issues that I'm just you know, kind of running mm -hmm. through in my head is like, all of this stuff is like very brand new to me, and I wouldn't exactly know like the right way to, to integrate this into a, a whole team unless everyone was kind of on board with the same pattern. If you like introduce it slowly, or it, you know, is this something well, in my current, so to give you some background on what's going on currently, I'm in the process of breaking out an extremely large application, Rails application to a bunch of small applications. And uh, some requirements have come in from the business, they want to create more things, which we haven't been able to add on to this existing monolith, which I've done in this style and kind of in introduced it slowly, you know. But when it comes to the education thing, you know, it's just, what does your team know? I mean, the only reason it works on Rails is because they all read the documentation, right? So, have them read some books on hexagonal stuff. Have them read some blog posts, and it's, you know, it's okay. And if you, if you look at this, like, the spectrum of the architectures, usually the more complex applications have different parts of all of those different things, you know? Just not, say, arranged in the same way. Like, you have form objects, and maybe you have like if you read the blog post by Brian uh, Bellcamp, the seven ways to refactor the active record models, he kind of introduces some of these concepts, you know, like quarry objects, form objects, things like that, but they're not, so to say, arranged in this way. You know, one of them is also like extract source object when these things happen. So if you were just to dump it, say, on a brand new person, they're probably going to blow their mind. But I think that most of us have probably experienced some kind of level of, of, of these things in our day-to-day -day work. Yeah, we've been using it. I haven't released, I haven't released a public version of it yet, but I've been using it in production now for a year and a half. I'm just, because I've been refining the, the abstractions that are in there. Mainly the one thing that's remaining is how easy is it to implement custom repositories and like mappers and things like that. How stable is the code as far as the API changes and stuff like that? Depending on the area, the only thing that's really changing right now is the repository. I haven't really changed it recently, but I am planning to um, take a good look at it because now I'm starting to get more people using it and they're giving me some feedback. And, but the public interface hasn't changed. It's only the internal implementation that's changed. So if you had created your own adapter based on some knowledge of the internal state, then you might have problems. But the public interface has not changed at all. What does uh, your jam chassis, what does that offer on top of Virtus? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Right now, not so much. The only thing that it does is it blows up if you try to send that thing junk. So for, I've, I've taken a position that I want to be very bitchy about, about things. Like, if you send me shit, I will treat you like shit and I will blow up. Um, it's, e it, it's easier, right? You don't have to worry about like these random player cases. So if you do, like in Virtuous, if you don't have an attribute declared and you try to send in, say, foo, it just silently ignores foo. So if, I, if you send foo to me, I blow up, right? And the reason I do this is because, first of all, you don't have to worry about, say, like these mass assignment problems, right? Because there's no private state directly exposed to anything. So I like this approach because it forces you to keep the clients honest that the things that are sending have to actually map to what's allowed. So if they do try to send you shit, they get shit back. Like, so now this is especially more useful in the API cases where you really need the clients to send you the correct stuff. So I can just capture the error that's raised, say like an application controller, and just say 400 bad requests are not allowed to send this parameter. I don't have to ever worry about handling junk or anything like that. At the moment, that's really the only thing that it does, and it I think it defines like a one other method, but it's 
that's it. So that I guess that's that's it. I hope you guys uh, learned something and maybe you have some confidence to try maybe try these techniques out in a a larger uh, larger domain. I suggest that you do read uh, my series of blog posts called Rediscovering the Joy of Design, which you can find on my website at Hawkins.io, and also my series that I'm working on right now on implementing and using repositories. So it comes covers um, pretty much like private internal implementation. What's it like in a larger application? What's it like when you implement your custom adapters? Um, you know, per class persistence requirements. Just you know, what's this stuff like? You know, in the real world, not in this little micro aquarium. You know. um, and if you have questions, feel free to find me after the conference or ping me on Twitter. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.